much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for all, uh, for everyone here for uh, hosting us and welcoming us to this uh, fabulous and uh, wonderful uh, city. Um, I will be thanking many people throughout the program, but really I wanted to start by saying we're here to celebrate uh, innovation and how innovation can uh, help uh, cure uh, many of the problems in our world and make our world a better place. But we're also here for something bigger, which is to celebrate a man, a company, a family that really stands by these ideals. Let me take a moment to tell you about Securing America's Future Energy. Uh, we were founded about 10 years ago, and our mission is to reduce US, US oil dependence for economic and national security. And we came together with a group of CEOs and four-star admirals and generals to talk about that economic and national security risk. And our chairman are the CEO of uh, FedEx, who could unfortunately not be here today, uh, but, but did appear on CNBC to talk about this great prize, and General Jim Conway, the 34th Commandant to the Marine Corps. And just two things uh, important to talk about that national security. The first is every major recession in the history of the United States in modern times has been preceded by an oil price spike. That's how important this is. And certainly in the last 10 years, we've seen the volatility going on in the world and the tragic injuries and deaths and the incredible service that we've seen of people who have had to go there in order to uh, try to stabilize that world. So this matters. It matters a great deal. Uh, for a moment, let me just tell you a history of the prize. This is our second time giving the Energy Security Prize. The first time was in 2013 as part of the OPEC Plus 40 Summit that we did. And let me point out that the first winner of the prize, Nostrum, the CEO, Kaushik Vyas, is here. And they have an important announcement to say that their high-performance gasoline injector is about to be revealed to the world and sold at the big SEMA show in, in uh, Las Vegas. So I think it's great that in about two years' time, since they first won the prize, we were able to uh, take them to this uh, point. For people to know that the process to come to the prize had really nothing to do with, uh, with me and, or our staff, what we, we did was is we um, put out a, a call for applications. They sent us, uh, we, we got these applications. We had two rounds of judging of experts. At one point, they came to CNBC in New York and filmed the 90-second pitches if you had the chance to uh, see them. And, uh, and finally, there was a public voting over the last two and a half weeks where we've gotten over 30,000 uh, votes. So it's really a, a long process that they've gone through, bringing them to this day when we'll announce uh, the winner. And I want to remind everyone who don't, doesn't know that this is actually going to be a TV show. So we apologize in advance if there's going to be some silence. Over there is uh, CNBC. It's uh, going to be on Power Lunch. They're going to be interviewing live. You are the studio audience. You should think of yourselves as like America's Got Talent for Geeks. <laughs> so uh, there'll be a live uh, portion, and then we'll announce the winner at the end. So that is one reason where uh, it's going to be a little long. Please try to bear with us. We understand it if you can. Well, right now, it's uh, really my greatest pleasure to introduce Anita Zucker, uh, the chair and CEO of the Intertech Group. Uh, certainly someone who doesn't need an introduction to all of you, who you admire as well. Um, she's a uh, proud South Carolinian. You know, most importantly, she was a public school teacher for 10 years, which is uh, so, so admirable. She's an ardent philanthropist, really an accomplished and vision-driven, mission-driven CEO. And really from the bottom of our heart, um, we thank her and uh, her entire family for um, sponsoring the prize. Um, it's meant so much to uh, SAFE, but it's really uh, the innovation that you see coming out of the Intertech Group and their commitment to make the world a better place just means so much to this country and to the world. So we're honored to have uh, this year's prize powered by the Intertech Group, and we're equally honored to welcome Anita Zucker to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon for this very special award ceremony. To the SAFE team, I can't thank you enough for all of the hard work and energy, no pun intended there, um, and dedication and for all of your pursuits of innovation and energy reform. 
Your efforts are greatly appreciated. SAFE's primary message of action and change echoes the thoughts of Jerry Zucker. Sometimes referred to affectionately as a mad scientist, Jerry was a gifted inventor and lover of all things relating to science, technology, engineering, and math, ultimately testing his ability in each with a triple major from the University of Florida in math, physics, and chemistry. Jerry then completed his master's in electrical engineering before serving in a number of roles, including research and development, engineering and operations. The culmination of these experiences led to the creation of the Intertech Group, a global holding company that owns or has investments in a wide array of industries, including aerospace, specialty chemicals, financial services, alternative energy, good term, consumer products, location-based entertainment, real estate, sports teams, and arenas. Since being founded by Jerry in 1982, the Intertech Group has grown substantially through a series of acquisitions, expansions, takeovers, and organic growth. Philanthropy and community service are ingrained in the foundation of the Intertech Group with a focus on education, workforce development, and STEAM initiatives. So now we've added that A into STEM for the arts because of innovation and creativity. The Intertech Group currently supports programs within the top colleges and universities in South Carolina, including Clemson, thank you Clemson University for being our partner, Trident Technical College, the Citadel, the University of South Carolina, the College of Charleston, and the Medical University of South Carolina, just to name a few. Jerry's life work and his tireless passion for science and innovation were present in everything he accomplished. A staunch advocate for energy reform, Jerry spent the last two years of his life passionately working to create alternative methods of producing energy in an effort to move us away from dependence on oil. Jerry worked with agencies, utility companies, and entrepreneurs throughout South Carolina until the very end. Unfortunately, his work was cut short when he was taken from us at a young age through a terrible disease. Throughout his career, Jerry's skills and intellect led him to create more than 350 invention disclosures that resulted in hundreds of patents and commercially successful processes and products worldwide. At the time of his passing in 2008, the Intertech Group had operations in North America, Latin America, South America, Europe, and the Far East. If you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life, was a message Jerry often passed on to others. The quintessential optimist, Jerry took every opportunity to bring the very best out of himself and everyone he met. In everything he did, he brimmed optimism. The glass was always half full for Jerry, always getting things done yesterday rather than tomorrow, and I've had to adapt. The Intertech Group is a perfect fit as a supporter of SAFE and the Energy Security Prize. If Jerry were with us today, this is precisely where he would want to be, exchanging ideas, pushing for change, inspiring others to achieve the very best and always searching for the perfect team. A born leader, he understood the importance of teamwork as an integral component in facilitating creative thinking and problem solving. He empowered people to achieve success and always inspired a bias for action. I'm proud to be here today and proud that the Intertech Group is supporting such a worthy award. As I prepared for this event, I was reminded of a quote by John Quincy Adams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Thanks to each of our semifinalists for your leadership and inspiration. Congratulations to each of you for your outstanding achievements and good luck. May the best team win. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Vice President for Research at Clemson University, Dr. Larry Dooley. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here today to represent Clemson University and our president, Jim Clemens. In this celebration of the extraordinary creative work of these Safe Energy Security Prize finalists, seeing what these teams have accomplished reminds me of an Albert Einstein quote, logic will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. And I think that's appropriate for the work these teams have done. It's also appropriate because there is a Clemson connection with Albert Einstein. Many of you may not know that Albert Einstein's eldest son, Hans, was a Clemson research engineer in the Agricultural Experiment Station back in the 1930s. Now, we'd like to take credit for both Albert Einstein and his son, but that just doesn't seem uh, appropriate that we embrace them as part of the Clemson family. But we certainly embrace Albert Einstein's philosophy on the value of creativity, and so we're particularly excited to be part of this celebration and competition. To the semifinalists of the Safe Energy Security Prize, you have shown extraordinary talent and imagination, and you're using these gifts to take on the very noble cause of finding ways to reduce our nation's dependency on oil, to make for a cleaner environment and a greater economic security. We all have a vested interest in this cause, and we're very grateful to you for all your hard work and imagination. I also want to thank and congratulate our dear friends, Anita Zucker and her family, Andrea, Jonathan, and Jeffrey, for the prize and for inviting Clemson to be part of this celebration. This is just one more example of your curiosity to discover and your husband and father's vision and commitment to science, technology, and innovation. How fitting that the Safe Energy Security Prize is honoring Jerry Zucker, a brilliant scientist, a very successful entrepreneur, and an excellent businessman, as you heard, with over 350 patents. Although I never had the privilege to meet Jerry, I'm certain if he were here today, he would challenge all of us to find solutions, make lives better, and heal the world. That was Jerry's focus, and it continues to be his family's focus. We are proud to be here with you today to honor his work, his achievements, and the beautiful legacy in you that he left for all of us. Thank you. I'm actually just really here to tell you to finish up your lunches. We'll resume the program in about uh, five minutes. Um, thank you very much. Can I get everyone's attention? So uh, it's, it's very exciting for me to always introduce the four-star admirals and generals we get to work with at uh, SAFE. It makes me feel insignificant. But other than that, it makes me proud to live in a country that has uh, so many amazing uh, men and women who are willing to put their lives on the line for something that, they, that we all so, so believe in. So today, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, General uh, Michael Buzz Mosley, the 18th Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. Um, he served for 40 years, and he was a career fighter pilot. He also served here at uh, Sumter, at Sumter uh, South Carolina, at Shaw Air Force Base, and uh, they liked it so much that they have now moved there uh, full time, and they uh, live in South Carolina. Um, he was a commander of uh, CENTCOM, uh, in charge of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, the bases there, and really they had to deal with uh, all the hot spots in the world in the last um, 10 years, from uh, Iraq to Afghanistan to the Horn of Africa and Yemen, and so I think there is really no a better person to really talk about the dependence on oil and what it means to our country and to the Western world than General Buzz Mosley. Thank you very much. Well, first off, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, but more importantly, for the Zucker family, Ms. Zucker, thank you. 
uh, for doing this uh, in the past today and tomorrow with what you're doing in your family. Thank you for the creativity and innovation that you're showing and the support for new ideas and better ideas. It really matters. So thank you for being a big part of this. <clears throat> And for Clemson University, a fellow land-grant college, thank you for being a part of this also. It's always good to hang out with graduates of land-grant colleges. For those of you that don't know, I went to Texas A&M, which is another land-grant college, <laughs> much like Virginia Tech and much like Clemson. Let me, let me start off a little bit at about 50,000 feet, not unexpected for a fighter pilot. But let me start off high and talk about the things that I have seen relative to the demands on this country, our coalition partners, and our allies, and a bit about the national security imperatives and the challenges that I see, because this fits exactly into what we're gathered here today, beautiful state of South Carolina, a little bit northwest of Charleston to talk about, and the opportunities that present themselves along the way for energy security. First, I believe we're not living in a Mr. Rogers neighborhood. I think we're living in a dangerous crease in history in a dangerous place uh, for our country, uh, for our coalition partners and allies, but equally important for our families, our children, and in my case, three granddaughters. And I believe the, that there are clear and present dangers to the life that we have in the United States and the values that we hold dear. And this variety of national security challenges facing us and the international community revolve a lot around energy. For my 40 years or so in uniform in the American military, specifically a small aviation enterprise known as the United States Air Force, and for my ongoing work in the American Enterprise Institute, the East-West Institute, and the Council on Foreign Relations, I'm convinced that the global challenges of tomorrow will literally revolve around three key life-sustaining elements, and that's access to water, access to food, and access to resources, specifically energy. And if you think about that for a minute, even a graduate of Texas A&M University, that should not be a surprise, because historically, those are the elements that cause nation states to go to war with each other over access to resources, over potable, usable water, and over arable land for food to sustain a population. No different now than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the United States? We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, but let me, let me offer another thought for you. What does that mean to the number two and number three economies on the global stage of China and Japan? If you think about the late 1930s, what forced Japan into the corner that they found themselves in was complete dependence on outside sources for energy. The Imperial Japanese military had on hand probably six weeks to two months of energy supply uh, in the late summer and early fall of 1941. So when Franklin Roosevelt hit them with an embargo because of their activities in China, it forced Imperial Japan to make a tough choice. And unfortunately for us and everyone else, they chose poorly, but then unfortunately for them, it didn't turn out too well. And think about China, the largest booming set of uh, population centers, a growing expectation of a middle class, a growing notion of property rights, a growing notion of industry, and a desire to participate on a global stage all dependent on energy. And 80%, 80% of their POL, petroleum oil and lubricants, goes through one choke point in the Straits of Malacca as they import that energy into that engine that is the People's Republic of China. So think about their dependency on energy. So when we talk about energy security in the United States, we're a part of something a bit bigger. So just reflect on how that impacts us economically, militarily, diplomatically, uh, and politically, because those are the kind of the key elements that define national power and the ability to influence or persuade across a global stage. Also, oil dependence lies at the heart 
of both our country's security and prosperity. So being able to generate larger amounts or to save larger amounts has a direct impact on the United States' ability to function as an economic power, but also as a military entity and to have influence diplomatically and politically. I'll give you a couple of examples. The Air Force, that small aviation endeavor that I referenced, is the largest fuel consumer uh, in the U.S. government, spending over $9 billion uh, annually on energy, and that's at current rates, with close to 90% of that being jet fuel. Imagine my happiness as the chief of staff when the price of jet fuel hit $165 to $170 a barrel. Every day I would wake up $4 billion behind since none of that was budgeted or funded. The lawyers and the contracting officers used to come in and convince me that it was okay to write hot checks for $4 billion. <laughs> I suspect the statute of limitations is over uh, on all of that <laughs> since the U.S. Congress chose not to budget uh, those fuel expenditures but kept the United States Air Force and the Navy and Marines and the Army engaged. Another example, in my previous life out in the Middle East at Prince Sultan Air Base, when we were conducting operations in Afghanistan and preparing for operations against Iraq while we were doing Yemen, Horn of Africa, Somalia, et cetera, I went to the government of Saudi Arabia and asked them for fuel. And to be honest with you all, Saudi Arabia never said no to anything we ever asked for. So sometimes the bashing of Saudi Arabia kind of falls on deaf ears with the United States military because the Saudis have never said no to us when we needed to be able to operate out of their airspace or operate out of the Arabian Gulf. And notice I said Arabian Gulf, not Persian Gulf. At Prince Sultan Air Base, I went to those guys and said, we're going to need some fuel. And they said, what do you need? And I said, I'm going to need 50 15 million gallons of fuel, open storage, and I'm going to need 15 million gallons of fuel a day to sustain this one base. They said, done. I said, but your highness, you know, this is not a small request. And he said, general, he laughed. He said, general, you might have heard of a small family business that we have here in the kingdom. And I said, what's that, sir? And he goes, Aramco. He said, between my, co my colleagues in Aramco will get you your fuel. The next morning, there were five miles of 3,500-gallon tank trucks lined up outside the base. And for every day during that series of hostilities that we operated out of that one base, not the other 37, for a total of 38 bases, there were five miles of fuel trucks. The other example is in Afghanistan. From the very beginning of Afghanistan in October, November, when we started uh, actions against hostile Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces, it was obvious to me that we had to do better relative to energy and fuel. And the one coalition piece of this that we shared with the British and with the others is for every gallon of fuel downrange, diesel, that we use to power a generator, it took 14 gallons of transportation expenditure to get the one gallon to the place that we had to use it. So imagine how many young American women and men we had on roads moving fuel that consumed 14 gallons to get to a place where we just really needed the one gallon. So all of the improvised explosive devices, all of the hostile, all of the fire, all of the fighting over those lines of communication, imagine what could have been had we had the technology to reduce the amount of transported fuel to be able to operate at the site. And guys, I'll tell you, that still keeps me up at night, thinking how many young Americans and British, et cetera, people we put at risk because we don't have, we didn't have the technology to reduce the footprint on the transportation of that POL. So, I believe for the 21st century, reliable access to POL, petroleum, oil, and lubricants, is an essential piece of any element of U.S. military 
but I would also add U.S. diplomatic and U.S. economic and U.S. political strength across a global stage, especially when you deal with the number two and number three economies of the globe that are nearly 100% dependent on offshore oil and through the choke points of one and two places that could be interdicted. And we're not even talking about the food or the potable water. As a reference, we're not here to talk about water, but the groundwater in northern China from Beijing north down to about 3,000 feet is not usable because of industrial waste uh, and pumping into the groundwater. So imagine a population that large completely dependent on trying to figure out how to get water and how to import a sufficient amount of energy to propel that economy. So my conclusion is we can make the United States truly safer and much more secure by reducing our dependence on offshore oil and make decisions on what we're doing here right now and take actions, policy actions, that incentivize creativity, innovation. For instance, let's look at producing more domestic oil and gas. Let's look at how do we get at that? How do we incentivize American companies to go out, and let me take a bold step here and say I would include Canada and Mexico in this because North America is effectively an, indiv an indivisible entity when you think about economically. So I would say when we talk about America, I would include Mexico and Canada in that. Being from Texas, Mexico is easy to include. Canada is a long way away from the Red River. Uh, but to be able to incentivize domestic oil and domestic gas and to be able to move that across North America, whether it's pipeline, which is the desired method, or in trucks or on rail, really begins to create an environment where we're much more secure and we're much less dependent on offshore. And how about the incentivizing notions of delivering much more efficient designs for aircraft, aircraft engines, automobiles, trucks, the utilization of those. General Electric and Pratt and & Whitney in, in uh, work with Rolls-Royce, for instance, have new big airplane engines that are 15 to 20 percent more efficient just by being able to gear the compression sections on those engines a little bit better. They have several programs. The Air Force is obviously the biggest investor in that because we burn more jet fuel in the Air Force than anyone else. So if you could save 20% on the design of a jet engine, then you can, you can actually begin to realize some savings. The design of new aircraft with composites makes a lot of difference too because the aircraft are lighter. The Boeing 7-8 that's built here in Charleston is a great example of that. Automobile design, engine design, uh, all of that matters so much. And then what about the promotion of development for alternatives to oil? empowering key transportation needs. There are several ways to look at that, through renewables, through synthetic fuel, et cetera. All of these things matter. So the advancements of these technologies reduce our dependence, diversifies the transportation sector, and I like, yep, hang on. <laughs> I like the notion of American ingenuity, addressing these issues with American hard work, American investment, and Americans providing the answer. I'll leave it with that because this matters for our children and for our grandchildren. So let me close with congratulations to the finalists for your creativity and another thank you to the audience for being here, joining us, and a big thank you to Ms. Ucker and the family for making all this happen. God bless you guys for doing this because it really, really matters. So thank you so much.
we use our second life electric vehicle batteries, meaning that if you're working in a driver and show you both and you drive it for three years and you turn it in a lease, and what happens to those batteries? Well, we take them and we make these really interesting products with them. This one allows you to get electric vehicle charging anywhere, but the most fascinating one we have is something called the MobiJet, which is a system that replaces these generators or gas generators on sites like film, uh, work sites, construction, or anything else. So in the case of electric vehicles, how many vehicles a child, he used to bring so much junk, wires and that, and I couldn't, I like him, and I, this was making me angry. I said, we're going to build him in the garage a, a room, and all his junk will go to this room, and here he can do whatever he wants. And uh, 
At one point, he made an explosive device and ended up blowing the porch off the house. And one day, I get a call from my neighbor. A rocket went to the sky. I called the police. I rushed home and I said, what happened? He made a rocket and wanted to try it out. And then he used to always have these inventions. You've heard about the garage and he used to invent in the garage and when he would make these projects for school. When he was 14 years old, he developed a telemetry system that ended up going to the moon. Uh, it ended up being the, the telem telemetry system that NASA used on the first lunar lander. It's hard to believe that what that 14 year old invented, I had to look up what he called it. And he called it a revolutionary phase factor for collinear electromagnetic magnetic waves. I don't know what that means at 41. <laughs> We lived in a trailer, a mobile home, when we got married. So, I mean, life was really different. When we were in college, we ran a deli. And we, we both cooked. Jerry was a great meatloaf maker. And I used to make the potato salad, and I made pasta salad, and we worked hard. He was brilliant. I mean, he just understood things, how they worked. And it really all made sense to him in such a very clear way. It just seems to me that not everyone has in them both an ability to invent and then also an ability to make. And here was a person who saw the world and understood it, saw the way the world could be and operate, and how from the physics, uh, from Newtonian physics all the way to business, and then was able to take those ideas and actually make something of them. My father taught us that our role as human beings is not just to exist, but our role is to make the world complete by taking the pieces that might not be fully put together in the right way and placing them together, creating order among chaos. As a Canadian, you know, I first became aware of his business, business accomplishments when he bought the Hudson Bay Company. And then when you begin to look at the Intertech Group and what they've built and what they own, um, it's not just in one industry, it's just so diverse from specialty chemicals to equipment parks to uh, and energy to real estate and hockey teams, my favorite coming from Canada. He was not a one trick pony. He really had a special gift for building such a diverse business. He was also a scientist and he was an inventor and he believed in encouraging scientists to come to new discoveries. What most people would call an attic in our house was a laboratory. And my father, throughout his life as an entrepreneur and a CEO, he continued working in the laboratory and in inventing, and he loved to encourage other scientists to invent. And when those inventions can lead, to, lead towards social impact, even better. It's such a privilege to be sponsoring the prize in Mr. Zucker's memory, and that it's his family who chose to do that, because it's really the legacy that he's uh, left behind, that they see this as such a tribute to him, and that they need to continue his work. Any sort of technology that could lead us away from dependence on oil was very important to him from both a security standpoint and an environmental standpoint. And these were issues that he really instilled in, in his children. He said, we need to work on this, please. When I'm no longer here, let's please make sure to continue working on this. definitely gave me the aspect of taking care of people and you know just standing behind everything that you, you do. My father taught me one of the most important lessons in life which is that nothing is ever broken. Everything can be fixed. Things that other people look at and say this is garbage I need to throw it away. My dad said let me take a second look at that. What can we do with that? How can we make that better? How can we make this work again? You know you can do good deeds all day long but you have to believe in, in why you're doing those things. Why do you reach out? Why do you care for your family? Why do you take care of them? Why do you look out for your employees or your associates, your friends? And it's really about being a loving and caring individual. 
And that's exactly what my father was.